At 19, I'd found the perfect subject while cashing a check one day. His name was Ryan, a banker at Wells Fargo. He wore glasses, which was my thing. And I liked his style. So this was a deep attraction. He looked at me with tenderness and really took an interest in what I was saying. I had only stated that I might open a new account, but this guy really cared. <laughs> the lines between someone doing their job and someone hitting on me were blurred beyond all recognition. I was like that guy that goes to a strip bar and says, hey bro, you see that girl over there? She came up to me and started taking her clothes off and grinding on me. She wants it. She's totally into me. As far as I was concerned, Ryan wanted it. So my friends and I devised a plan to further investigate him without being too overt. I showed up at his financial institution dressed in all black with a 1950 scarf tied around my head, sunglasses in hand. I'd read far too many Nancy Drew novels as a kid and trusted that I'd be inconspicuous like this. <laughs> Which was the complete opposite of what had taken place. If you ever want people to take in your existence in its entirety, wear all black and sunglasses at night. They'll stand there tilting their heads like dogs when they hear a strange noise. <laughs> the only saving grace is that they won't speak to you because they're afraid. <laughs> we started with a phone call to the bank claiming that we were his friends from out of town and wanted to surprise him by leaving a note on his car. His coworker informed us of which vehicle was his and the time he'd be off. We took our phone calls a step further and looked him up in the phone book. My friend dialed again and played the role of his friend from out of town, inquiring about his current relationship status and place of residency. His parents were far more trusting than his coworker, <laughs> and told her that he was going bowling after work, provided the name of the location and the address of the house where he'd be staying for the evening. Some people are far too <laughs> lacking in skepticism. We could have been planning to murder him and they made it so effortless. Fortunately, we were all very well-adjusted people. A bit overly curious, maybe lacking in boundaries, but overall well-adjusted. <laughs> we followed him to the bowling alley. I was shaking like I used to when I'd taken too many diet pills. <laughs> While waiting in the parking lot, we determined that one of us, it couldn't be me, would venture into the building and see what he was wearing outside of work. Back then, I believed clothing said a lot about a person, and I had standards. Yes, they were shallow, but the bar had been set. She entered and then rapidly exited the building with a look of bereavement on her face. I'm really sorry, Holland. He was wearing carpenter jeans. <laughs> and an anime shirt. I looked down at my feet with compunction. How embarrassing. If his attire said anything about his character, he was probably a youth pastor or a gamer and most likely a virgin. So we did have that in common. <laughs> Although Ryan was no longer a love interest for me, the idea of getting caught still held our attention and we wanted to see how long we could get away with it. We were juveniles playing Harry at the Spy. After he left, we discreetly followed him on his commute to his friend's house. Drowning in peer pressure, I followed my friends as we journeyed over to the house and peeked inside. I despised the feeling that came over me. I'd flash back to the days of doorbell ditching in my neighborhood and feeling like a complete asshole. The slowest runner and a huge jerk for making someone come to the door only to run away from them. <laughs> this thought distracted me from the situation at hand, but the shouting of a masculine voice brought me right back to the moment. Who is that and what are you doing out there? I can see you. This sent us running as though we were characters from a Wes Anderson film, never caught and feeling fulfilled after completing another fruitless mission. <laughs> Ultimately, I ended up banking at a different branch. <laughs> but this behavior wasn't new for me. I'd had a lot of practice and a track record that lacked in success. The 12-year-old me 
<laughs> laid, laid on my bed, eyes longingly gazing at the Herculean poster of Jonathan Taylor Thomas taped to the ceiling above me. My first love starred as the middle son of the Tim the Toolman Taylor on the 90s sitcom Home Improvement. He wore overalls, sans the fastening of one strap, acceptable and hip at the time. And the brawny man couldn't hold a candle to the way he looked in flannel. His voice was gravelly and stuck in that awkward vocal purgatory between prepubescent and adolescent. His face frequently graced the pages of most teen magazines, which I inevitably spent my allowance on, no matter how many times I'd read the trite articles about his favorite color or what he first noticed about a girl. Our initials were ink stains on my trapper keeper. H and H plus JTT <laughs> equals L O V E. <laughs> to quote Tiger Beat magazine, JTT was H O T. I suppose there should have been an intervention at that point, but aside from my chemically imbalanced obsession, I was a good kid. I didn't do drugs and I'd never even kissed anyone. My adolescence mostly consisted of only being asked to slow dance when a boy lost a bet. It was safe for me to like a celebrity. JTT didn't sit behind me in class and circle no on my do you like me notes. The delusion that this child star would choose to be with me above all the other girls remedied my low self-esteem. When I purchased my final teen magazine, I struck gold. His agent's name was listed in an article about Jonathan. This was it. I'd call information, get the agent's number, call the office and get Jonathan's number. The plan was flawless and simple like our soon-to-be romance. <laughs> As the phone was ringing, I had no idea what I should say but it didn't matter. If this was the right place, I was one step closer to meeting my better half. My utopian conversation was about to be complete. I waited for the receptionist's response with the optimism of a child on Christmas morning. Within the same second, she crushed my dreams and hung up. This was clearly not the response I'd anticipated. She was screwing with our serendipity and my hormones. Hope was not lost, though. I was resourceful. Shortly after the telephone incident, I was watching a morning talk show with my mom and learned about a promising foundation called Make-A-Wish. <laughs> to my understanding, this was a foundation to which you, compo you composed a letter explaining your ultimate wish, including why you were special enough to have it granted. Now this was a cause I could get behind. <laughs> a foundation that was all about helping people that really deserved it. <laughs> people like me. <laughs> I got to work immediately and began transcribing what is probably the most ignorant letter the Make-A-Wish Foundation <laughs> has ever received. The tale of a preteen in perfectly good health requesting to spend one week on the set of Home Improvement with Jonathan Taylor Thomas. <laughs> a letter with the word really, really? used countless times <laughs> when describing how worthy of this wish granting I actually was. When explaining my feelings for JTT, I disclosed that my heart melted into sprinkles of love dust <laughs> whenever I saw a picture of him. I didn't know what love dust was, but it sounded poetic. <laughs> I made sure to let them know that I was aware a week might be too much to ask for, and I'd be willing to take three days if that was the best they could do. <laughs> I didn't want to be greedy. After about a month of anxiously waiting for a response, I received a letter of rejection explaining that they couldn't grant my wish at that time. I guess I wasn't the type of sick person that they could help. <laughs> it was too complicated to be involved with someone famous anyway. The fact that I had written to a foundation that was based on the granting of wishes of people diagnosed with a terminal illness 
didn't occur to me until I was significantly older. <laughs> I'd like to think that there's some sort of statute of limitations on embarrassment, <laughs> but I've yet to reach that milestone. <laughs> I'm still holding on to that love dust line, though, because someday it's bound to work. <laughs>